I'm a chemist at heart, actually. I was in pharmacy school first. And when I was just at St. John's University in Queens, New York, I loved pharmacy and chemistry. It was phenomenal. However, practically, you know, when I was in my third year, heading into my fourth year, I realized, well, what do pharmacists do? Well, a lot of them just work at the local, you know, CVS, whatever, and they, they do good work. I mean, they count pills all day and writing, you know, uh, doing all paperwork and all that kind of stuff, but that's not chemistry for me. That was not what I wanted. So I had jump ship. I said, well, what do I do, you know? So I actually went to NYU Dental School, okay? I was there for two years, and I jumped ship again. Now, why did I do that? See, dentistry is a wonderful profession. I wanted to be a prosthodontist, which is putting in artificial teeth and all this kind of stuff. Well, when I was in my second year, I was in periodontics where we did cleaning the teeth, scraping the teeth and so forth. Um, and I said, I, I can't do this. I mean, I was good at it, okay? I said, I can't scrape teeth all day, okay? So then I jumped into medical school, which I enjoyed thoroughly. It's a wonderful college out in uh, Kirksville, Missouri, um, an osteopathic medical school, super phenomenal. And even there, I didn't, couldn't put my finger on what I wanted to do. I liked cardiology, but I didn't love it. I liked surgery, didn't love it. Um, and as I rotated through my third and fourth year, I rotated through pediatrics. I said, maybe I'll be a pediatrician. The first IV I put in a baby with the screaming, I still hear it now in my ears, okay? So I said, no, that I cannot handle. Surgery was good, very intense, liked it, but didn't love it. Internal medicine, uh, ob I liked. I liked the gynecology, not the obstetrics. If there was a baby coming, I wouldn't be there to deliver. Because <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to deliver babies, okay? But they made, of course, we had to deliver babies. But it, it wasn't my interest. I didn't just, I liked it, but I didn't love it. I didn't want to really, the gynecology, the surgery, I said, hey, this is pretty good. But at that time, they could always combine the two. And I didn't want it. If I couldn't do one solely, I said. So anyway, I wound up doing now my first year residency, which I had to rotate through all these specialties again. And it's just, it was concerning me. It's like, what am I going to do? I'm not sure exactly. So a friend of mine, said, hey, I know someone who does hair transplants. I said, hair transplants? And I looked into that, and I fell in love with that. That was it, okay? I said, hair transplant surgery just fascinated me. And then ultimately, when I got involved with hair transplants, of course, I opened an office, focused on hair transplant surgery. Uh, I wanted broadening that to other cosmetic dermatologic procedures, you know, and so forth. But hair transplant surgery was the key. That was most of my practice. And I developed that in New York. It, it prospered, we did well, and so forth. Now, this is the key. I was getting busy, needed help. So I had interviewed a few doctors. One doctor came from Bosley. He wanted to leave Bosley Medical, which is a, a very good, uh, high, highly respected clinic uh, and group. So he wanted to be on his own. And I had interviewed him, his name was Tom. I said, Tom, uh, I wanna take you on board. I want us to be partners, okay? But on his CV, it said that he worked for urology for a year. Now, he's an internist. So I said, Tom, what are you doing in urology? Like, where did that come in? You know, I was just curious. He says, well, I had a few friends doing penis enlargements. And I said, penis enlargements? How do they do that? He says, well, we cut skin off the behind, open the penis, and stitch it in. Okay, which I thought that was the most barbaric thing I ever heard of in my life. Okay? So in my mind, I said, you know, there's got to be a better way. Now, in the 90s, we had certain fillers right? Facial fillers for the lip and cheek and all that. But it only lasts 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. I said, if we had a long-term filler, that would be the answer, okay? Now, this was in 96. Let me give you a time frame. I started my practice in 92, 3, uh, built it, hired Tom, 96. Um, he put that seed in my head about penile enlargement and how they do it. I never forgot it. So time went on, okay? And by the time 2004, rolled around, I had an opportunity to move my practice to Florida, okay? I took a few years off, okay? But when I got back into action there about 2008 or 9, I was thinking about this male enhancement, penis enlargement. But of course, I went into hair again. That's my main thing and other cosmetic stuff. But as I was doing research, I realized that we did have something. There was a medicine on the market that with small modifications would work as a male enhancement permanent filler. So I had tested it, 
because again, I'm a chemist at heart, right? So I'm back in chemistry. I'm back in kind of compounding medicine. When I started in pharmacy, I'm kind of winding up in pharmacy. It's kind of an interesting 360 deal. So when I put these medicines together and tested it, and the, the objective was you put the permanent filler in, it's supposed to generate collagen, permanent collagen, which it did. Okay, and that's important. So then, well, from that point, I said, well, okay, we're going to advance and we're going to start treating patients and so forth slowly. You always go slow. And so we were monitoring patients. We realized that, wow, this is a phenomenal product. The formula itself causing collagen production in a permanent fashion. I said, this is going to change the world. Really, it's going to change the world. Uh, so from there, we started getting busier, obviously, with the male enhancement, because I'm the only one that would have a permanent solution, really, for the girth, at least, part of the male enhancement. So that developed rapidly. So I said, well, I'm going to focus on that, because hair transplants, there's many doctors that do that. There's not too many that do male enhancement with permanent filler, right? So it's kind of a minimally invasive method. There's other treatments, such as fat transfer, which is surgical, uh, alloderm implant, which is surgical, other implants, again, surgical. Patients are looking for the safest, least invasive way, obviously. We all do, okay? Men and women, they search for these things. So now we have something that's very effective, um, works phenomenally well in regarding the girth category. Now, there could be some length gains with this too, okay? Uh, like, for example, let's say a patient comes in, let's say there's six inches in length, five inches in girth. Girth is just a circumferential measurement. Of course, the length we know. So let's say, for example, the girth we increase from five to seven. Okay, so a five inch girth to seven is quite a big difference. Okay, so five, five is like that, seven maybe like that. Um, but when you get the girth so large, right, it could push the penis forward and increase not only the flaccid length, but eventually it could kick out the erect length too. We've seen this. Now, I don't kind of tell people that. I say, look, if you get a rec length increase, consider it a bonus, you know. But you got to get pretty sizable because when you inject the filler, it's a three-dimensional expansion. So in the beginning, the flaccid length will continue to increase, increase, increase. But when, let's say, for example, a patient is six long, let's say we put filler in, he gets girthy, and he hangs six now. So his flaccid length is optimized. Now, if we keep on putting filler, well, is the penis going to go? Okay, so that's to push forward even more. And we've had cases where a well, patient said that they've gained an inch, okay, which is great. Okay. I don't really mention it too much because we haven't been measuring that consistently. So I always tell patients there's a possibility that this can occur. So overall, the direction, the whole course of my, my life here okay, started with the seed of the doctor in 1996 having some uro urological uh, wording in there that he was involved with. And it changed my whole course obviously. So I was glad that I was able to, at first, get into something I loved, hair transplants, and then tipped into another thing I love to do, and which I developed and patented, and so forth. I'm kind of the inventor of this thing, this whole thing, this permanent filler, uh, and has been working out quite well since. Well, when I was developing this formula, I realized that we needed to protect it, right? We think of, well, if you develop a formula and just don't do anything, uh, there's no protection, and anyone could do anything with it, which I didn't want, because it's very specific, it's very detailed. It had to have certain characteristics about it to be safe, and I didn't want anyone messing around with that. So I was developing this, uh, and then I said, okay, if we're going to do a patent, we have a patent's very difficult, it's not so easy, okay, especially something like chemical-related. So when we were drafting this patent, how to make sure that we had the protection we needed, how to be broad-based in many ways, and so forth. Um, and it took a couple of years, you know, to finalize this, okay? In the meanwhile, I did other patents like hair implants, artificial hair implants, which you could talk about, penile lengthening device, and so forth. But the key is this formula, okay? Um, we originally were denied the patent, right? When we submitted it to the U.S. Patent Office, uh, U.S. PTO Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, they denied it because they said, well, uh, there might be something out there similar or whatever. You had a fight with them. That's what we did. We had to kind of do a little battle. So I said to the patent reviewers uh, the, at the U.S. PTO, I said, look, no, 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 you're missing the point here. I said, 
you're assuming this, this, and this, right? So I had to present an argument, a rebuttal to what they were saying, which I did. Uh, and then I said, oh, they said, oh, I see, you know. I said, okay, all right. So they approved it, okay. Then I said to myself, okay, so we got a U.S. approval, but what if we go international? So now we decided to go to 40 different countries, right, to submit patents. And that costs a mini fortune, okay, to do something like that times three or four, because I had other patents as well that I wanted to go abroad with and so forth. So those who are involved with patents, be careful because when you initiate a patent, get it approved, there's payments that are due every three years, right? So for upkeep or whatever it is, whatever they call it. Now, if you have a patent in 40 countries, every three years, you're going to get a bill for that times 40, okay? for each country to maintain and all this kind of nonsense, right? But anyway, aside from the cost, which just be careful anyone entering into patents, you might want to stick with, you know, when you do a patent and you want to produce this product, whatever it may be, uh, I would stay with basically English speaking countries and the biggest economies, you know, you could eliminate a lot of, let's say you could pick really 10 areas of the world that will work for you. I picked a little bit more just to cover my bases, but, uh, like, it's funny, I picked China, right? They approved my patent there. They, they accepted it. But the problem with China, unfortunately, is that they're probably using my formula now. You know, that's, uh, I can make a joke about it. But how am I going to fight China? You know, I'm going to say, hey, you're using my patent. You're patent infringing, you know? You can't do stuff like that. Well, you, you should, but I'm not going to be fighting them. Not that, I'm, not that they're doing that, but it's kind of curious to even think if they would and so forth. So the patent world is a difficult one. It's more of a defensive position now. When you have your patent out there, you have to defend it and so forth. But the bottom line is this. We have a phenomenal formula that works extremely well. Um, and our next step is we, we have all these medicines that we mix together and use as this formula, this filler. Uh, and as physicians, we could do that for our patients. We're allowed to compound and administer to our patients. But what we want to do is we want to take it to the world. And how you do that is if I can get an FDA approval in the US and a European approval, basically it can go worldwide. And we're in the process of that right now.